neonatal spine. We'll look at how to do it, the clinical indications, normal anatomy, and then some of the uh, pathologies that we see. So spine ultrasound is the preferred method for evaluating the spinal canal in neonates and young infants, with the exception of the meningocele. Um, we don't use it for that, but if they're suspected closed lesion, we use ultrasound. Best done prior to about three months of age, because at that time the posterior spinal elements uh, start to close. Before that, they're not fully ossified, so you can use ultrasound. The beam is transmitted into the spinal uh, canal. At three to four months, when the posterior elements start to ossify, it's, it's, ultrasound is going to be limited. So you put the patient prone. Um, you flex the legs a little bit, creating with a little blanket or pillow to get a kyphosis. And then use a standoff. You can try it without a standoff pad, but sometimes they squirm too much. You may have to use a pad to minimize motion. You place the transducer in the midline. You get longitudinal and transverse scans, and we scan routinely from the thoracolumbar junction to the coccyx. You want to, just with the regular transducer, linear transducer, but then if you have it, use an extended field of view so you can show the entire cord, which allows you to count the vertebral body so you can determine the level of the conus. So what are the indications? Cutaneous findings that have an association with closed spinal dysraphism, hemangiomas, hairy patches, masses, dimples, skin tags. If you see these, um, you'll find a lesion in about 50% of the time on ultrasound. And perforant anus has an association with an abnormal spine. 14% have tethered cord. So these are some of the clinical stigmata. This is not subtle, a mass over the lower back. This is a hairy tuft over the lower back. This is a little skin tag. And this is a dimple. This is the anus. It's okay to have a dimple here close to the anus. If you have one high on the back, higher risk of having an underlying abnormality. All dimples are not the same. If the dimple is low, as I showed you, near the anus, midline, short, less than five centimeters, low line, um, low risk, low risk of a spinal abnormality. Do we still study these kids? Yeah, okay. This is a finding you see in about 5% of normal newborns, dimples. If it's high, if it's large, if it's um, further from the anus, if it's off midline, a higher risk of having an abnormality. Normal spine. When you do ultrasound, you want to see the spinal cord. You want to see the tip of the cord, which is the conus medullaris. You should be able to identify the subarachnoid space. The phylum terminale, which is a fibrous band of tissue that goes from the conus to the sacrum, it supports the cord. So we've patients prone. Okay, um, we've got the spinous processes here. They're not ossified yet. Here's the dura, that white line. Here's the subarachnoid fluid, the dorsal subarachnoid fluid. Here's the cord with central echogenic complex. Here's the cord, and it tapers, and the end of it is the conus medullaris. Here is more subarachnoid fluid on the other side. And here are the vertebral bodies. These are some nerve roots here. And there's some nerve roots here. Here's the conus medullaris again. I'm just going further down. The phylum terminale extends from the conus to the sacrum. It is anterior. It's a very thin band, two millimeters or less. These are nerve roots. These are nerve roots. The phylum should be less than or equal to two millimeters. Uh, if it's thicker, it can indicate a tethered cord or a lipoma. You want to separate the phylum from the nerve roots, which have the same echogenicity. The phylum run along the dorsal part of the cord. The nerve roots are ventral. Phylum, nerve roots.
Okay. Transverse, um, it helps confirm an abnormality. Most of us just read from the long axis view. That's where you're going to see most of the pertinent anatomy. But here you have the dura, the cerebral spinal fluid or subarachnoid fluid, the nerve roots, the cord, more cerebral spinal fluid, dorsal ventral. Add color. Really, nobody uses this. But if you add color, this is what you're going to see. Lots of pretty color. And I've never known it to help in making a diagnosis. OK, so when you do this, you know what it looks like. Now you have to see where the level of the conus is, because normally it's above L3. And it ascends to the adult level of L1, L2 by three months of age. Now, there are two ways to do it. Count down, count up. This is really what you want to do. But to do count down, you find the last rib, uh, which is the last shadowing structure overlying the kidney. Then you move the transducer to the midline, and you're presuming that's T12 uh, if the patient has 12 ribs, and you count down. So here's the last rib it shadows. Here's the kidney. And from there, we count down, and we determined that the conus was at L1. This is not a terribly reliable method, but it's been described. This is what you want to do. You want to count up. You start at the sacrum, and you count up. You locate the S5 segment, and the last ossified segment is S5, and then you count up and count the vertebral bodies. That's where you need your extended field of view transducer. Okay, you want to lay out the entire, entire cord. So we've got the entire cord here. This, the last ossified body is S5. Coccyx doesn't ossify. 4, 3, 2, 1, 5, lumbar, 4, 3, 2, 1, T12. The conus is right here, someplace between L2 and 3. Again, you see some nerve roots here. You see the subarachnoid fluid. This is how you count. There are a few anatomic variants that you have to recognize. Uh, these usually disappear after birth, and not, they're not significant. Dilated central canal, you can see fluid in the central canal, and you can see a cyst in the phylum. So this is your conus. This is your cord. Remember, the cord has an echogenic canal, but sometimes that canal contains fluid, shown in the schematic. Leave it alone. It's just a variant. How about this? This is the conus. This is the cyst and the phylum. OK, leave it alone. It's not, it's not going to do any harm. It's going to disappear. And one more variant. Normally, the cord has a tapered uh, end. But in patients who have um, caudal regression, which means they have a hypoplastic lumbosacral spine or missing part of the lumbosacral spine, the spinal cord can have a wedge-shaped end. So this is a patient who is uh, missing most of the sacrum. Okay, And I've sort of inverted this or put it on its side. Here's the cord. Instead of a tapered appearance, it's got this blunt appearance. And there's the corresponding MR that shows the blunt termination, just a variant that you see sometimes with spinal anomalies. So what are the pathologies? They're not very common, but I'm going to show them to you. Maybe, you know, one of these years you'll see some of these. We're going to classify them into two types. One, where there's abnormal closure of the uh, spine and the skin. That's spina bifida aberta. That means the open neural tube defect. And then we're going to look at the closed spinal dysraphism. The problem with any dysraphism is that it can tether the cord and lead to lots of problems with bowel and bladder control and neuromuscular problems. A tethered cord means that the conus is displaced below L2, L3. It's more dorsal in position than the normal cord. The nerve roots don't move. The phylum may be thickened, and you may see a mass. This conus right here is at L4. That's all it takes to call a tethered cord. That's a tethered cord. Okay, there was, There's some echogenic fat in the canal. That patient had a lipoma. 
I'll get back to that later. This is a tethered cord. This is a person with an imperfect anus. The cord's here. It's at L5. This cord has a normal shape. In this case, it's at L5. That's tethered. So specific pathologies can tether the cord. Myelomeningocele, open dysraphism, and closed dysraphism, and there are a lot of pathologies here. This is the myelomeningocele. The neural plate fails to close, so everything, the spinal cord, spinal contents, cerebral spinal fluid, go through this defect in the spine onto the back, and there's nothing covering it. There's just sort of like dura or arachnoid, not even skin covering it, okay? It's covered by meninges. It's obvious clinical, and these patients go to surgery quickly, and it's associated with Chiari too. This is what it looks like. This is a meningocele. This is just a arachnoid tissue covering this. And the Chiari 2, if you remember, was the herniation of the vermis into the upper spinal canal. What do we do with that? We do not image these because they're not covered. And there's a real risk of infection if you image them. I've done it once or twice because the surgeon wants to know are there nerve roots in there. I think now, though, we force them to do MR most of the time. But this is what it looks like. One of the opportunities I've had to scan this. And these are just meninges, and these are nerve roots, and this is just cerebral spinal fluid. And this part of it is the cord going into this meningocele. Here's the uh, MR, the myelomeningocele, with just meninges covering it. So that one you're probably not going to see, but you are going to see occult dysraphism. And these are skin-covered lesions. They present with a mass of some of the lesions that I showed you earlier. And the ones that present with a palpable mass are the lipomeningocele, terminal myelocystocele, and the anterior meningocele. The lipomeningocele. It's sort of similar to the myelomeningocele, except it's skin covered. And it contains fat. It contains a lipoma, which is contiguous with the subcutaneous fat, and it tethers the cord. So this is a patient with a palpable mass. Here's the cord. It's surrounded by all this echogenic material. Here's subarachnoid fluid. It's continuous with the fat in the back. That's what a lipomeningocele looks like. Much easier to see on MR, but look at that. There's the cord going into the fat. Lipomeningocele. Terminal myelocystocele is a rather complicated lesion, but again, it's skin covered. And it's characterized by a dilated cord that terminates as a huge cyst, okay? And it's surrounded by expanded dilated subarachnoid space, which is called a meningocele. And the spinal cord is tethered. So this patient uh, had a palpable mass. Here's the cord, dilated cord. This is the end of the cord. It's dilated. This is way down by the sacrum. And this is dilated subarachnoid space. That's what a myelocystocele is. Here's another one, dilated cord. So that's really the myelocystocele. Is a dilated cord, and you can see this is the cord being pulled down. It's tethered, and you've got dilated subarachnoid space. So here it is, lots of subarachnoid fluid and um, the dilated cord. That's a myelocystocele. And the anterior meningocele is herniation of meninges with CSF into the vertebral body. The cord may be tethered or it can be in normal position. It is skin-covered lesion, and you're going to see a fluid-filled sac that's contiguous with the spinal canal. Here is the spinal canal here with fluid, subarachnoid fluid in it. The cord was at normal position. And then you have this herniation of subarachnoid fluid into the soft tissues. There's skin covering it. Here's the MR, the cord's normal, and you've just got subarachnoid fluid going through a bony defect, and it's covered by skin. So all of these, the myelocystocele, the anterior meningocele, they're covered by skin. They have a bony defect in the vertebral bodies, and the spinal contents protrude through that defect.
you can have closed dysraphism without a mask. These patients, again, may have just some cutaneous abnormality or maybe neuromuscular abnormality. These, once again, include the simple meningocele, which I just showed you, a phylum lipoma and the split cord. Phylum lipoma, there is fat, okay, in the phylum, in the phylum terminale. Right here, there's fat. The cord may or may not be tethered. 6% of the normal population have fat in the cord. So here's the conus. Here's the phylum. It should be two millimeters. It's thick here, and there's a lipoma, phylum lipoma, okay? Note that the rest of this is normal. You see subarachnoid fluid. You see dura. You see normal vertebral bodies. There's no bony defect here. Okay, this is just in the phylum. Here's another one. Lipoma. Here is the phylum, and this cord is tethered. Surgical specimen showing the lipoma and the cord. And this is separate from the subcutaneous tissues. If you had fat in the spinal cord and it was contiguous with the fat in the subcutaneous tissues, then you'd have a lipomeningocele. Vertebral bodies are intact. This is just a lipoma. And the final one is the spinal cord malformation. The um, diastem or the spinal cord is divided into two by a midline spur that arises from the vertebral body. Uh, the spur may be cartilaginous or bone. It divides the cord into two. The cords usually reunite at a lower level and Clinically, they can have scoliosis and lower extremity weakness. So you see two cords. Here's the path. Each has its own nerve roots. They have separate tubes. And again, the uh, septum may be bony, fibrous, is fibrous or cartilaginous. This is what it looks like. You see two cords. Here's one cord, two cords, and there's the spur, echogenic. And here it is. This is a really easy one. You see two cords. You see the central canal. You see the dura, subarachnoid fluid, and the MR in that patient. So in summary, ultrasound is a great tool for evaluating the spine and the neonate. Uh, you can see closed neural tube defects and lesions with fistulous tracts. If anomalies are detected, further evaluation often is done uh, with MRI just to get better definition of anatomy for the surgeons. So thank you for your attention.